Good morning. My name is Rhonda Miller, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. I work at Iowa City Hospice, providing music therapy for hospice patients and their families. The overall goals of Iowa City Hospice Care are to bring comfort and peace to patients and families that we work with, as well as to add life to each day. Music therapy is a valuable part of the interdisciplinary team approach in helping to address these goals. Today, in this presentation, I'm going to start out by defining or explaining music therapy to you. It's a fairly new and a growing profession that's gaining increasing attention as a result of research that's being done about music and the benefits of music when it's used therapeutically. And I'd like to also provide you, I hope, with some new ways to think about music and some tangible ways to use music in your own life to benefit yourself and your loved one. I hope this presentation feels a bit like your own personal consult with a music therapist about ways to use music for your own personal benefit. So what is music therapy? Music therapy has been an established and allied healthcare profession for over 50 years. After World War II, musicians went to hospitals to play for veterans suffering both physical and emotional trauma from the war. The patient's physical and emotional responses to music led doctors and nurses to request that musicians be hired by hospitals. While the benefits of music itself were evident, it became apparent that additional training would be necessary and helpful for these musicians to prepare to provide quality care, and so the demand for music therapy and college curriculums teaching this led us to where our profession is today. The American Music Therapy Association defines music therapy, as you see here, the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relation by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. If you're like me, this definition requires a bit of pulling apart to make sense, lots of big words. So I've highlighted the key words that define music therapy. Use of music, interventions, individualized goals, therapeutic relationship, and credentialed professional. As you see from this list, music therapists work in many different places with a wide variety of individuals. Because of this, it can be challenging to define music therapy as it looks somewhat different depending on whom the music therapist is working with and what the individualized goals of therapy are. However, in each of these settings, music therapists are using music to address cognitive, physical, emotional, and social needs of the individual. As a music therapist with hospice, I'm going to focus in on, in depth, how I use music to benefit the patients and families that I work with. This is one of my favorite quotes, and it's hung on the wall of my home for many years. Peace, it does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. Music is one way that I find peace in the midst of noise, trouble, and hard work. Music helps me return to my center and find that calm in my heart. As a music therapist working in hospice care, I use music to bring comfort, peace, and quality of life for each patient and family that I work with in the midst of the noise, trouble, and hard work of saying goodbye. To work as a music therapist, one must have a bachelor's or master's degree from an approved college or university, have completed 1,200 hours of clinical training, including a supervised internship, successfully completed the National Music Therapy Board Certification exam, and every five years either take that exam again or in the meantime have completed an additional 100 certification credits. The, the therapeutic relationship is such a key part of what happens. We know music benefits, but when you are, combine it with a therapeutic relationship, that's where some extra special things happen. So I work really hard to develop a good rapport with patients and families. I'm very interested in learning to know them as intimately as they're comfortable sharing and creating an open and safe environment. And the bottom one being what makes this special about, mus about a music therapy position is that I'm committed to learning what the individual's preferred music is and using that music in our, inter inter in our interactions. So I meet with individuals to assess their strengths and needs. I talk with family members to learn more about them. Who are they? What's, what, what's their life been filled with? And to hear how everyone's doing. 
And then I work within an interdisciplinary team of physicians, nurses, social workers, spiritual counselors, home health aides, and trained volunteers to provide them with individualized care. Through observation, interactions, and the information gathered, I select music interventions that will help to address the goals of the individual and their family. So goals in hospice care. The way I use music depends solely on the needs of the individual and their family. These needs may change, depending on the day and what is happening in that moment. So I'm constantly reassessing and adapting my approach to best address what the needs are in the moment. But some of the goals that I'm looking at and thinking about are, you see them listed here, physical, cognitive, emotional, social, spiritual, existential, and quality of life goals. For example, under physical goals, pain is much worse when you feel alone. If you're feeling depressed, or only focusing on your pain. So music can help to provide that distraction and a different focus of, of attention until a pain medication starts to work. For example, a story of a time when um, music worked very well, a nurse was trying to give a medication to a patient. The patient had advanced dementia, was very agitated, even to physical touch. So I um, asked the nurse, I said, would you allow me to go into the room first and be there for 10, 15 minutes? And I am going to just use music to set, you know, the, the environment. Let's change that environment a little bit. And I went in, and I had never met the patient before, and I went up and I oft often touched someone to say hello, and she startled, and I realized, oh, that's right, the nurse just told me that. <laughs> so I stepped back and um, decided that in this case, I often use my guitar, but in this case, it wasn't even, I didn't want that much stimulus. I just wanted the, the, the voice, and so I started singing just those old, familiar, you are my sunshine, bicycle built for two, and the wonderful thing with live music is you can slow it way down to just meet what we need to do. And so at that point, it was just let's gradually get her in a comfortable space and used to interaction because she's so in her own world right there. So then as I saw her becoming more comfortable, her brow relaxed, then I reached out and touched her hand and she, was, she could tolerate touch. And um, eventually the nurse came in and I think she was a little skeptical at first, but she gave the medicine and she said, that was so easy. I have some other cares I need to go do. Can I come back with toothbrush and those types of things? So the music just helped to transition that patient from that um, alone, isolated, hard to know how to interact with the world to a, a positive interaction. Another example of addressing a physical goal is I'm working with a patient who has involuntary muscle contractions. And that causes is so uh, hard to relax. And um, so the music is simply used just to help her focus on the music and her body responds to that music that then those muscles really do just relax. Her hands can lay down, her shoulders can drop, and she can fall asleep. And um, this morning it was great because a nurse came to me and said, she's still having she's still having benefit from last week's visit, which that's, learned, that's something that helps me because sometimes I wonder, I know in the moment music helps, but how long does it help? And research is showing that often there's a benefit for dementia patients, patients with dementia at least for several hours. Um, one of, an experience I had recently that was pretty profound about how music helps those with dementia was a patient was very agitated and when I came into the facility the nurses said can you help this person she's she's just nothing's working today and when I approached her she grabbed my hands and through tears said help me find myself and that was just one of those moments that almost brings you to your knees for the the you know just how profound that very comment is and so I, I sat right down, and again, it was not a time for the guitar. It was a time for hand-holding, looking in her eyes, and singing those songs that are familiar, that help to orient. And she did, you know, she just looked at me, and she just sobbed for a while, and then she um, started to smile, and she started to sing along, and then she started to say things like, you're so young. I mean, she was oriented to the point of being able to actually 
communicate with me at, where before she was speaking in word salad and she was just able to engage and calm and feel comforted by the music and that connection, that person there in front of her. There's so many stories that I don't want to overwhelm you with, but um, I've also heard from a spouse, you've given me a glimpse of my husband. And sometimes in the emotional, social goals, what I help to facilitate is family interactions. There was a young girl, who, uh, great granddaughter, three, Grandpa loved her to come visit, but her energy was all <laughs> over the place. And Grandpa was a little overwhelmed by that. So if we could focus her energy into the music. So sometimes it'd be her singing and playing instruments. Sometimes it would be Grandpa singing his songs, because they were different songs, um, and her playing instruments along with it. Or she'd just spontaneously dance like little people do. So sometimes the music is simply to help facilitate those positive memories and family interactions. Um, so interventions used by music therapists in hospice care singing familiar songs, listening to live or recorded music, mainly live music is my tool. In fact, I brought my guitar along today simply because it's my um, security blanket. It helps me to feel like I have my tools with me. Um, playing instruments such as hand percussion, I always keep some shakers and things like that in my bag. Learning um, music assisted relaxation techniques, sometimes writing song lyrics to help people express what's on their heart. Uh, discussing emotional reactions or meanings attached to particular songs. I've helped to record um, songs for individuals to give as gifts to their loved ones, working with a mom who had a little guy, and she said, can you help me record these five songs so that my son has these after I'm gone? So, and then the final one, assisting with music selection for the funeral. So there's all kinds of ways that music can help to address different goals that we spoke of. Um, if you were to walk past a room where I was meeting with the patient, it might look like, ah, they're just having fun singing together. And yes, we are having fun singing together. But I'm watching very closely their energy level. I'm watching their facial expression to see what's happening there. I'm being sensitive in the moment if a song prompts tears, then I stop and say, I see tears. Do you want to talk about those? Um, are, are you comfortable with those? Because sometimes people say, oh no, can we sing something else up, upbeat? I need to, ch I don't want to be here. So um, in the moment, using the music to assess what's happening, what's going on in the heart, what's going on in the mind, and in the body in response to the music. Um, and what do they need in that moment? So, like I said, there may be family and friends involved in the music making, or they may be simply holding the hand of their loved one while the music communicates what's in their heart. Sometimes music touches emotions in a way that allows for that emotional release of tears. And um, like I shared, that's when I stop and see if that's an okay thing. And sometimes people will say, I needed to cry. This, this is exactly what I needed to do. And then, like I said, sometimes they say, oh, let's change the music, I don't want to go there. So, um, and let's see. Um, so what is it about music? Well, music is central to our lives and it's embedded in our culture. It's how we celebrate special moments. It's how we um, connect with memories. It's, there's no side effects unless you use the wrong music. That can happen, because we all know the wrong music doesn't sound good to our ears. Um, but again, that's an easy one to change. There are very few re risks. It helps to soothe nerves and elevate spirits. There are actually also physiological changes in our body in response to music. For example, it triggers the release of endorphins, which are those feel-good chemicals that then trigger our sense of well-being and help us to relax, reduce perception of pain, and have a sedative effect. Oxytocin is another hormone that alleviates anxiety and stress and enhances feelings of trust and bonding, which again can help to lessen depression and loneliness. Music can decrease cortisol, so help us manage our stress because the, these other things that flood our body then help release those relieve us of some of those stress feelings. It also can regulate your blood pressure, your respiration rate, and your heart rate. 
And if you're singing, you take deeper breaths, so then it oxygenates your blood. And we all know that in meditation, we're taught to breathe deeply. Well, if you sing, you're breathing deeply and relieving anxiety. And then our body just wants to respond to the rhythm of the music, so it can help to coordinate our motor movements as well. And in addition to the physiological responses, people have an emotional and a memory response to music that stimulates positive interactions, facilitates cognitive function, evokes storytelling, memories, life review, and helps us remember who we are. And I love that picture because it just, it doesn't have music, but yes, that's what happens. I think through the mirror of music, you remember who you are or who you were, who you want to be. So, I hope I should go back to that slide. So with the help though of brain imaging, this is where some of the science comes into it. Just since the 90s, we've been able to see now what happens in the brain. We all, when you engage in music, you know what you feel like, but now we're starting to see what happens when people listen or engage, especially with familiar music. Numerous parts of the brain light up simultaneously um, because music engages different parts of our brain that process melody, rhythm, tempo, words, memories, emotions. So it's almost like a cognitive workout that happens. And for those with dementia or strokes, engaging in music helps to circumvent damaged area of the bright brain and allow for moments of reality orientation and access to long-term memories and emotions associated with music. I find that it sometimes takes about 20 minutes of music before, you know, that, that body and that face may just stay unengaged, but after time, the head comes up, there's eye contact, um, they may smile or even start singing or humming. And in some cases, like I shared before, even helping to orient to the point of being able to converse and share memories. And like I mentioned, I think earlier, studies have shown that the results of a music therapy session can sometimes last for several hours. The person I shared about that said, you've given me a glimpse of my husband said, after you left that night, he conversed with all of us around the table. He hasn't done that forever. And he said the Lord's Prayer from memory. It's been three years since he said something from memory. So for her, it was such a gift for me to have her say that back to me, because I don't know what happens after I leave but that the results of that orientation of the brain do last. So, what kind of music? Well, this is a key question because it's different for each person. Um, what, com what kind of music do they respond favorably to? What music makes their eyes twinkle and their toes start to tap? Um, what evokes memories? So that's where it's key for me to get to talk to family members if they can tell me. If there's not people around to tell me, I make sure I've looked at our chart and I see how old they are because it's music that's preferred by the individual, but if, I, if no one can tell me and I know how old they are, I can choose songs from their young adult years. Those are often the, the ones that get the most engagement. You know, our young adult years are full of promise and possibility and good memories. We're establishing our independence. Um, sometimes that's when we're starting to listen to music that's different from our parents' music. So um, those are, if I don't, if no one's told me what kind of music, then I kind of start going through the different genres from that age and see what, from that time period of their life and see what their response is. A quote again, the beautiful thing is music can be like a time machine. One song, the lyrics, the melody, the mood can take you back to a moment in time like nothing else can. So using music in your life, that's what I want to kind of transition to now. Caregiving has us managing two lives and balancing both. I hope to suggest some ways that music might help you with the balancing part bringing joy and beauty, meaningful interactions, and assisting you with self-care. Some of this may actually found, sound too simple, but bear with me, because the truth is music is free, it's easy to access, enjoyable to almost everyone, and able to affect people at the physiological and emotional ways to benefit from them. So the first one, these aren't that deep thinking, I guess. Upbeat music gets you moving. 
So, and you want to pick up the pace. Think about movie soundtracks, for example. Uh, we're not often paying attention to the reaction our body's having to that music that's happening because we're so in the story, but they are very skillfully using music to pick up our heart rate or to slow down our heart rate. Um, so if you think about that and ways to do that in your own life, what are some times in your day that would be helpful to be more alert or, um, and to engage in movement with your loved one? For some people, mealtimes. You, you just need someone awake enough to eat. Um, so using music then. During bathing, if that's not a pleasant experience, maybe add the stimulus of music and see if that helps to make it a more positive experience. To assist with exercise routines. This goes for both your loved one and yourself. Your, your exercise routine likely is quite different, but if, if you're like me, it's hard to, you know you feel better after you go for a walk, but it's hard to get out there. So if you put on the music that will get you moving and that you enjoy, or for your loved one, the exercise, they're not gonna go out likely and go for a hard paced walk, but sitting, you know, moving your arms to the music, maybe dancing to the music, um, that's another way to get active. And while you do those monotonous routines, chores, that can just change the mood. My own personal um, choice for house cleaning music is the Mamma Mia soundtrack. <laughs> That's the one that just gets, I, my kids will probably forever have house cleaning and Mamma Mia soundtrack linked in their mind. So, but upbeat music can just change things up a bit. It can add a different stimulus to a dull moment and prompt some get up and go. So do you need to pick me up? Just turn on the music, see how it changes the, the moment. And then the next one, the opposite reaction, right? Calm music. What are times that in your day when you'd like to transition to a slower pace? If you have an adult in your home that sundowns, goes through sundowning and gets really restless, that familiar music can help to orient and calm them. If you're preparing for bed or a change in routine that might cause agitation, or just simply for relaxation. So select music with a slow tempo, less percussive sounds, and feel your body respond physiologically to this stimulus. Music for stress management. Your stress as a caregiver might come from boredom, tiredness, feeling impatient. Your loved one may be feeling frustrated due to confusion or sensory overload. Um, sometimes when I'm watching people watch TV, it doesn't seem comforting because they don't know what's coming next. It's not familiar. And sometimes what's on the TV is so different from the world that they grew up in that it's hard to interact with that. Um, so in that moment when you feel like you might lose your patience or you just need a different approach, try singing or turning on the music. My kids know at home, but sometimes when mom starts singing opera, it means she's <laughs> trying to change the moment. Um, but it can just re redirect attention, reduce agitation, and improve mood. And then in that case, you get to decide what is it that you or your loved one needs in the moment. Would upbeat music be the right thing or slower music? And you, you can't go wrong. You can try one, see what the response is, and try something else. Because either, either will, will work just depends what, what is needed in the moment. If you can't tell already, I love quotes. So, music washes away from the soul, the dust of everyday life. I think for me, I think music can give us that clean slate, a fresh start, or just that different outlook in the moment to change a moment. So another way, you, using music to connect with your loved ones. We all need this, and it can be very hard when a conversation or traditional forms of communication are compromised. Music can become the conversation or the form of communication. It's an alternative means of maintaining a connection. So sing along. Um, sing familiar songs. They represent safety and security. The, they may not be able to engage in conversation with you, but having a shared exchange through singing can help your loved one feel successful, experience communication, especially if you're using lots of facial expression and making good eye contact. This is sometimes where we can listen to music, but it's not quite the same as engaging with someone else with music. So sing to them. If they can't sing along with you, 
um, they may be able to open their eyes in response to the music. Or may, and when they make eye contact, you can see that the music is connecting with them. When the words no longer come, some people can still hum along because their melodic memory is still intact. I don't remember the words, but oh, I, this, this, me this music is still in my mind. And the music itself can trigger positive feelings, memories, even when the words aren't present. Dancing. Sometimes we have to rethink dancing. Um, if, if actually standing and holding each other is not a possibility anymore, sit facing each other, hold hands, just rock to the beat, or clap, or you know, tap their legs for that extra physical, real gent gentle stimulation. Um, dancing is about and when it comes to, it's about touch, holding, closeness, and the music, and what that helps to facilitate. So rethink ways of dancing. It doesn't have to be the way we used to. And then getting your family engaged in making music together. Create positive mem memories and emotional intimacy. Do anyone in your, does anyone in your family play an instrument? Have a family concert. Um, create music together in your family intergenerationally. To love a person is to learn the song in their heart and sing it to them when they have forgotten. This picture represents that to me too, for me, because there you see the individuals and what they've forgotten maybe, or what, who they still are is what you see in the shadow. They're dancing individuals. So for self-care, remember that you need a break as a caregiver. You need to take some time to fill up your own cup. What are those things you do for self-care? Consider joining a community music group for your own personal benefit. I've compiled a list of local community music opportunities that you might want to consider trying for a change of pace, a change of scenery, change of interaction. There's a list at the back of the room that you can take home with you that has some local opportunities for making music. Um, Engage your senses, make new memories, trigger endorphin release, and make music work for you through engagement in a group that's having fun making music together. Another self-care there on the bottom corner is just to find your own inner calm and connect with yourself, because we've talked about using familiar music for older adults with dementia can help to orient them. It does the same thing for us. When I turn on music from the 80s, I'm back in high school. <laughs> um, and so, and sometimes that can be really fun, especially when my husband and I start to sing and the kids are just like, oh my goodness, you guys. But you know, it does, it connects with ourselves, our, our own memories, and it evokes pleasurable feelings for ourselves. So be sure to find some time when the music you're listening to is your own music as well. Um, this because that music can help get you through those tough days. And that leads me to this quote. Some days there won't be a song in your heart, but sing anyway. It's often the days that patients are feeling the worst that music therapy can be the most beneficial. And I have to be really sensitive because sometimes I come and offer a visit and they say, oh, I really don't feel well today. And then I have to kind of assess, um, well, can I just sing one song and then I'll, you know, or okay, I want to respect where you're at, but, but it is true. That music can help to improve your mood or simply allow you to express what you're feeling. Depending on what music you choose, it may allow you to cry or take some deep breaths. Sometimes we just need to be with a feeling and not try to move out of it, and music can allow for this. I have had patients say that, okay, come in, but we're only singing the blues today, and that's okay, and that's what we do. Um, I did recently, I was singing um, uh, What a Wonderful World, and a patient started to cry, and I said, do you want to talk about those tears? And she opened up and shared, and she told me this whole series of events of things that have been going on, and then she said, oh, I feel so much lighter. They're coming in to weigh me. I think I'm going to weigh less next. <laughs> so, so yes, just let music evoke those emotions, and... Uh, for her, it, it, it changed the mood. Sometimes we just hold that heaviness, and that's OK, too. So where can I get music? Where can I find music? Pandora 
Music.com is a music streaming service that you can access on your computer and phone. You create a radio channel based on a song you like, like and it generates the playlist. Um, it, there's a free option for that, but there will be advertisements. And what I often suggest to people, if you can avoid advertisements, it, it helps just because that can be confusing for someone with dementia. If you're trying to stay in this very calm, familiar space and then suddenly an advertisement pops up. Um, Spotify is another example of um, a music streaming service, but you get to actually hand pick your songs. It doesn't just generate for you. Um, I think there, I believe, there's an ad-free membership option for around $5 a month. iTunes Store is an online way to purchase music and download it to computer. If that's something that's new for you, you might, that be, might be a good way to ask younger members of your family to help you learn how to do this. I know my children are constantly teaching me about these options. And then your local public library. Here in Iowa City, anyway, we have a huge CD collection that you can access a lot of great CDs. And you may have your own personal music collection that you've kind of forgotten about. So um, records, cassette tapes, CD, CDs. Um, the record player, I find, when you can use that, God, that, that itself is a stimulus for memories. And grandchildren may really be intrigued by, what is this? How does this work? So different ways to access music and um, hopefully be able to find what it is you're looking for. So to wrap up. Use music in your life to remember, to change the moment, to improve your outlook, build connections with others, get in touch with your own emotions, and to add life and beauty to your days. Here's a few music therapy resources if you're wanting to find music therapists in your area. American Music Therapy Association is the overall organization. Iowa Chapter of Music Therapy would help you get in touch with people locally. And my information's there at the bottom. Um, feel free to call me as well, and I can try to help make connections for those of you that are interested in lear learning more about music therapists in the area. Are there questions or comments on what I shared? Yes. <laughs> well, to start off with, um, have you ever you or or anyone else you've ever talked to absolutely had a you know not just one failed intervention for a day but a a, a patient a client who simply did not respond to your services and if so could you tell tell me um yeah, I, I remember another meeting in this series where it I can't I can't even recall the um, the exact topic, but it was about an intervention where a woman stood up and swore to us that this worked every single time. <laughs> and I, somehow I just don't buy that. I am so gr grateful you brought that up because in my passion for what I do, of course I forgot to mention that, but no, there are times. Um, one of the jokes on me, if you will, is my own father who has told me, don't you ever come sing. <laughs> don't you ever come sing at my bedside. He said, what I want to hear, my dad's a farmer, I want to hear the sound of a pop engine. And so then he and I engaged in a conversation of, well, that's music to your ears. And But it was really good, because that was during my music therapy training that made me think, what? OK, preferred music. But you're right for some people. So. The joke's on me with my dad. I'm not supposed to go there with him. But yes, in my work, there have been times where a referral has been put in for a music therapy um, visit. But when I get there and I interact with the individual, I don't see it. And I don't base it on just one. I may go again, because with dementia, you don't know on the day, um, or with any of us for that matter. You don't know how they're feeling in the moment. So after two or three visits, if I see, you know, I'm not seeing any benefit. This person's not responding, or, or they're not interested. Then I, then I just bow out. But you're absolutely right. It is not a sure work for everybody. Just to follow up on that, do you see that those people having a particular profile or a demographic? Is it one sex or the other, one age group, you know, across the board? 
the disease or the problem. No, it's really there. I have I've yet to find that anyway. Um, it's been males, females, few. I mean, honestly, often when there's a referral, I do keep to seeing them. But there have been times where I've just said, no, this person. Sometimes it's simply that hearing is such an issue, um, or. And I've asked people with hearing aids, please tell me what kind of playing, because strumming or finger picking sounds very different depending on your hearing aid. And so I'm learning things like that too, um, about what it, you know, if you can't hear, well, so what? You're sitting in front of me singing, but I can't, I can't really engage. So that is sometimes one of the challenges is for those with hearing challenges. I have a question, and it well, more of a request, um, because like what you just said about hearing aids, that seems to be a really critical piece of information. So, can you just expand a little bit on how you ass what your assessment process is as a music therapist? Um, just knowing that caregivers at home aren't certified music therapists, but what are the things that they can be looking for? How did you know when the woman said, "Help me find myself"? that it was time to put the guitar away and, and connect. So just could you just talk a little bit more about how, your personal assessment? Um, personal assessment, again, all the joke's on me and learning, because I've been having these really positive interactions with one patient, and then one day I got there, and she was so agitated, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then finally, finally she said something that made me realize she didn't have her hearing aid in. But that was, I hadn't realized previously that she had been wearing one, so that was a good learning for me. I've, I've been working as a music therapist for two years, so I'm still learning um, and bumping into things. So one, then, once we found her hearing aid and got it in, then that changed the experience. So my, that was one example of when I realized, oh, my assessment on every patient, that should be just top of the line. I should know, do they need a hearing aid, and, and how does that work um, for them? Uh, so that was one part of your question. Um, the other part, I think, to that is... Just, you know, with the woman, how did you... Know, how did I know? Yeah, what was she doing that... Um, I think for me, because she was reaching out for me, then I didn't want to put a guitar between myself and her. Um, and guitar is a great instrument, because you can be very... I can be right beside you with my guitar, and we can, you know, still have that. I don't have. To, it's not like a piano that's between. But still, in that instance, like she literally reached out and took my hand, and so I wasn't going to say, "Oh, let me get out my guitar." It was, yeah, I let let's let's. So, uh, it's a great question, but it's assessing in the moment. She clearly needed touch because she was reaching, um, and when I think about music and how people have used it throughout centuries, one of the things that always comes to me is that often a mother, but I'll say parent, hum and touch to an infant. That's music in its simplest form, and sometimes that's just the very best. We don't need just the human, we need just the human voice. We don't need to add instruments to, um, get to the very heart of what happens in that interaction. So good, good thing to think about, though. Always be watching your loved one, seeing what their energy level is. Just because they, you know, too much of a good thing can be too much of a good thing. So do maybe half hour moments of music, and then turn the music off and just see what happens next. Um, just. Music can become noise. And so using it almost, I hesitate to say this, but it's almost like you're choosing a dosage of music. What amount will actually be helpful in this situation? And when have we stimulated enough? And let's, let's stop and, and let the person just rest in that, that orientation that happened. I have one more question, then I'll pass, because uh, I, I'm fascinated by all of this, and, um, you know, just that, that in your experience, 20 minutes of music is kind of a basic dose, if you will. I wouldn't have thought, I would think that caregivers would be hoping for a much quicker response than that, you know, and maybe abandon the process before it's really 
had time to take effect. But another thing that I've heard is that, like when you were talking about using music to bring somebody uh, energy level up so they can participate in cares and tolerate physical touch, etc., that you have to meet them kind of musically where they're at. Can you? And then the opposite would be true if they're agitated and you want to calm them, you have to, could you describe a little bit more sure. about how you have to meet them where, they at, where they're at before you ch alter the energy? We, we talk about the ISO principle. So it is, it's meeting that energy with the same kind of energy in your music. So if someone is really agitated, well then maybe let's start out by singing when the red, red robin comes bob, bob, bob and along, let's, you know, and then over time slowing down the music till maybe by the end you're singing Always by Frank Sinatra. A very different, um, so yes, that's a good point. Using the music to change, to meet the energy and then gently slow the energy down. Because as we talked about, that physiological response in your body um, will happen because of the tempo and the, the style of the music. And the wonderful thing, again, about live music is that you can, you can use a really, really fun song or upbeat song, but you can slow it down, too. I even within the song, if you're observing what's happening is going the direction you want it to do, well, by the end, you can just win the red, red rob, and you can just slow it down. <laughs> um, so, and the 20-minute dose, I guess I, I should be, I should clarify that I don't stick to 20 minutes of I'm gonna do this yeah. if, if what is happening on their face is clearly mm -hmm. not, there's no positive response. It's not like, okay, we're going for this regardless. So I guess that's more of a, when I was a new intern, I remember my supervisor saying, okay, sing another one. You know, maybe you've sung two songs, but there's just no response yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, letting it take time, letting things happen in the mind and in the heart. Um, so yeah, you may do a song or two and nothing happens, but maybe by the third or the fourth. But again, only if there's not a furrowing of the brow or a clenching of the teeth or, 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 or a turning away from you. If they physically turn their body, that's a very clear, not interested, so very much watching. Um, Those are great questions, you guys. Um, you talked about how how it's it's really important to have this individual interaction and assess on a minute by minute basis. But um, you've also talked about the woman who didn't have her hearing aid in, and you didn't know that. How important is it for? initial feedback and continued feedback from family members if if the patient cannot or the client cannot really tell you much about themselves. Oh, right. That's And that is where I lean. It's very important. And that's where I lean very heavily on the interdisciplinary team, too. I really like that I work with a team because each member that interacts may learn some different piece of information, and we try very hard to communicate those to our team um, so that the rest of us know, you know, he played baseball. Oh, well, so maybe the next time I sing a song about baseball, you know, any of those types of things. But yes, it's very important. And I sometimes, if I'm visiting someone in a long-term care facility and no family members are there, we'll just do a phone call later on. And, and we also have a communication book Whenever we go in to um, visit a hospice patient, there's a book in the room that all of us that visit leave a note in so that the family can step back later and, and come to see mom later that day and then see, oh, the music therapist was here today, the home health aide was here yesterday. So that really helps to facilitate communication too. And that's helpful. May I just speak from my own experience and ask you about some of these issues. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a certified music therapist in place at my dad's facility. And 
I, I find myself, particularly since I was the initial contact person and I was the initial um, viewer of her, of her work with my dad, while I can see this this great response that she's given to him individually as she's been working with him. There are also some things that I find myself really wanting to suggest but not knowing whether I should. Should I be a busybody and intervene or should I let her figure these things out for herself? It's a very good question and it depends so much on your therapist. You know, it depends on their personality. I would hope that if someone would approach me, that I would be very open to, oh, that's wonderful. Any, any information or advice you can give me. So I, that would be my response to you. Sure, tell them. Um, tell them what you have seen, observed, or what you think might help. If they're, I would hope that they would be open. Um, well, for instance, the issue of volume. Um, I, I was, I was convinced just from my dad's personality and his previous response to music. I was convinced that that she was singing too loudly, but then I, I, you know, she. This all kind of went through my brother, who was the next one there. We only have one of us visiting a week every month because we're all out of state, and. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's just complicated by these other, these other issues where we're communicating amongst ourselves to say, please tell the therapist this, and um, trying not to target, I guess, me as the busybody. <laughs> um, but... Uh, she, she's already replied to my, to my comment that, that the volume might be a little loud because I could, uh, in some, in one case I can think of, um, my dad hates to hear people swear or use any kind of even nominally bad word. And when she sang, she sang a, a a stanza a bicycle built for two that included oh, oh okay <laughs> and she and it's about it's about what happened after this guy proposes to Daisy and she really emphasizes uh, the kind of well what a lot of people would would think would be Daisy's very funny answer but my dad was just <gasps> No, and I would say yes. Tell your th make sure she knows. She she toned it down because my brother videotaped the next when he was there the next sequence, and so you know some of it she's just responding to as she should like any yes. any trained music therapist. Right. You're trying to you're trying to assess, but I would also hope even if you hadn't said that, and she saw his reaction that she would have filed that away for oh. Yes, okay. She did. Okay. Good. She did. Yeah. 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 Well, and I mean that, and it just, you know, even I. One of the things I'm so hesitant to use is hymns unless I know. I don't use a hymn unless someone has said this is an important part of who I am. So um, some people make an assumption that oh, music therapy at the end of life must be singing hymns. No. It. It only if that is what's meaningful to the individual. Um, so again, that whole assessment and any information you guys can give about this is who dad is, this is what he did in his life, this is how he relaxed, you know, any of that stuff just helps to paint that picture for her or him, the music therapist, um, as to who the individual is you're working with. We're good at, at uh, we we in, we as a group compiled a biography, and uh, then distilled it down to some some bullet points about some of the issues. But you know, for instance, we didn't we didn't actually address the hearing issue, and so and then you just said how he relaxed. We didn't address that either. We talked about some of his hobbies, but. Um, 
Well, so what else? What, what other? What other key things might uh, might family members bring up? Yeah, I, I, for me, what I like to hear from family members is what you that just the bits and pieces that make up who this individual is. Um, yeah, because it just helps me know who I'm interacting with, and maybe thinking of oh, what music might prompt then a sharing about that. Um, and then sometimes as a music therapist, I feel like, oh, wow, the interaction that's happening here, I really wish there was a family member here. Yeah, because... How important is there to... Is it for, yeah. How important is it for a family member? Well, only... It's not... How do I say? It, it, wonderful things are happening for the individual regardless. It's just that if the family member's present, then they're getting to hear those stories. Because I often feel like I'm on the receiving end of amazing stories because the music prompted this story and I think, oh, and so then I will try to write that in the communication book of dad shared about this today, um, you know, and then I hope that I've built enough of an open where they're like, I've never heard that story and they'll call me and say, tell me more, you know, or whatever to have that kind of an interaction. But um, so if I can facilitate, try to be there at the same time as a family member, it, it's just a, a neat connection for everybody. But it doesn't have to be. He's having a wonderful experience with music therapy, even if, and, and sometimes, this is something I keep thinking about, is if there would be ways for me to record music therapy sessions and, and sh share them with family members that are at a distance. That's what we did when my brother was there. He, he brought his uh, pad and, and just. Sure. Yeah. And did that. That's neat. And that way everybody gets to see. And, and while I focus so much on individual music therapy sessions, there are times that music therapists certainly in many spaces work in groups too. It's just hospice care is so very individualized and individually focused. But I do need to clarify that certainly there's lots of good music therapy happening in groups. Um, when that list that I mentioned before of all the places people work, a lot of times it is group work. Um, Isn't that necessarily less effective, though, if it's not one-on-one? -on -one? Depends what the goals are. So if the goals are uh, learning to express oneself in a group or um, interacting socially in positive manners, then, no, then, then that your goal, you would better reach those if, if the group was together. And um, so, but it, in hospice, Generally, we're not working to build skills. A lot of other music therapists are working to help build skills in the different facility um, with the different clients they're working with. For example, children with autism or um, in some uh, adult daycare centers, you're working to maintain skills or build skills. But in hospice work, music therapy is so much more about the, the moment and reviewing and connecting and rela um, calming and relaxing. So it's a little bit of a different kind of music therapy than some of the other spaces and places where music therapists work. Yeah. Okay, this is the last thing I'll comment or say, but I just wanted to share, because I was a caregiver for um, my partner's grandmother for, she was uh, from the years when she was 95 to 100 years old, and uh, she was a Polish immigrant. And so a lot of the music that was coming back to her at end of life was not in our language. And it was folk songs and um, laundry washing songs, and she spoke uh, Polish and German. And so we, you know, as some of her, her core caregivers, really took it upon ourselves to because she sang them all the time. And so we just learned them phonetically. We had no idea, you know, I mean, she would kind of teach us what they were. Um, but that was really important to be able to um, speak in her la language at th that was the kind of preferred at that time. And even when she was um, had moments of confusion or um, delirium, she would revert back to either German or, or Polish. So just, you know, that was just another piece of 
that was music to her ears, you know, our ability to be able to say good morning in German or, you know, to sing the washing song in Polish was just like this instant orienting for her. So that was uh, powerful to, to experience that. Oh, what a gift you guys gave her yeah. by doing engagement. Well, and, you know, and interestingly enough, um, I mean, the caregivers that were surrounding her at that time were not family. You know, and I don't really know if family had ever taken time to learn these songs or, you know, so I would encourage family caregivers to definitely um, yeah. learn those things about the person's past. But, and, anyway. and we have, uh, with, with internet, we can access so many things. You know, I was working with someone who was Danish, and so again, that's another, like, piece of the puzzle then, but then I just, I looked up Danish lullabies and it just so happened that the song I came and sang, the person said, my mother used to sing that song to me. But, but again, we have, the internet makes it so much easier to like find. Um, yeah. Or I learned to sing a song in Swahili for someone um, because that was their original language. And I don't know Swahili, but I could yeah. listen to it on, um, off of the internet and then go sing that for that person and then that yeah it's just another level of connection and familiarity yeah well there's no more questions thanks so much for coming i hope this has given you guys some ways to think about music and um, using it to benefit yourselves thank, thank you, you. rhonda mm -hmm.